in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, welcome to St John's Worship for Palm Sunday. Usually we would begin our worship on Palm Sunday by processing around church with our palm crosses. Of course we can't do that this year, so instead, as you can see, I've brought you with me on my daily walk to Pocket Park. So this will have to do as a virtual procession today. If you've got a palm cross with you, then in a moment I'm going to invite you to hold it up for a virtual blessing of the palms. And by all means, pause the video now to go and find yours. But before we get to that blessing, let's just take a moment to pause and to remember that God is with us in our homes, in our gardens, on our phone calls and on our walks. Wherever we are, God is present to us and in God we are present to one another, members of the body of Christ which cannot be separated. So peace be with you. So as we begin our blessing of the palms, I invite you now to repeat after me. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So my dear friends, in Christ. During Lent, we have been preparing by works of love and self-sacrifice for the celebration of our Lord's death and resurrection. Today we gather our hearts and begin this celebration in union with the Church around the world as we enter together into a Holy Week which will be like none other that has gone before us. But still Christ goes ahead of us to Jerusalem to complete his work as our saviour, to suffer, to die and to rise again. And so I invite you now to hold up any palm crosses that you have as we go with him in faith and love so that united with Christ in his sufferings we may share in his risen life. God our Saviour, whose Son Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die. Let these palms be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. So we hear the collect for Palm Sunday. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so now, with my thoroughly blessed palm, uh, I'm going to process back to my curacy house where we will hear the reading of the Passion Gospel. So, friends, welcome back to my vicarage where I have processed with my palm cross. 
Usually on Palm Sunday, the blessing of the palms would be followed by a dramatic reading of the Passion Gospel for Holy Week and then a Eucharist. Now, I can't bless the bread and the wine like Reverend Helen, but we can still have that dramatic reading, thanks to a group of people from St John's who have all sent me voice recordings of them reading different parts of the story. And so for the main part of today's service, I offer you that passion reading now as a meditation for us as we begin this very strange Holy Week together. After that reading, we'll have some prayers written this week by Keith from St John's. But before we listen to that Passion Gospel, I offer you just two reflections of my own. First of all, as you hear that reading, really pay attention to the different voices that you hear. I've asked 10 different people to send in recordings. And as you hear those different voices, remember that you're really not alone at the moment. Although we might be isolating at the moment, we're still part of this family at St John's and actually of the church around the world. We're still part of this great group of people who are still meeting, whether virtually like this, or privately at, at home, quietly saying our prayers faithfully. But together, all of us are forming this great cloud of witnesses surrounding the world in this blanket of prayer and praise at the moment. Remember that you really aren't alone. And secondly, as you listen to the reading, pay attention to Jesus in particular who becomes increasingly isolated as the story goes on. The Gospel begins with him sharing a meal with all of his disciples, but it ends with him dying completely alone on the cross. But in a sense, it's at this moment of Jesus' greatest isolation that he's also the most connected with all of us. Because dying alone on the cross, Jesus offers up his isolation as a great act of compassion for the whole world. It's an act of forgiveness for all the people who know not what they do, as an act of solidarity with everyone who finds themselves marginalised or suffering. So it's here at this moment of the greatest loneliness that we find God in Christ most deeply connected with all of our lives, and for that reason, I think the cross this Holy Week stands as a particularly powerful sign for what we are all being asked to do at the moment, offering up our isolation, our loneliness, as an act of compassion for the entire world. And so with that in mind, my friends, hear the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St Matthew. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said to them, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says my time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed, and began to say to him and to one another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. 
Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never drink again of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new, with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come to into time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword and drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. 
Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus, so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. 
Now, at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realised that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over to him. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want to, me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus? who is called the Messiah. All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand, and knelt before him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him, and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe, and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene called Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, 
Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, and the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that impostor said while he was alive. After three days I will rise again. Therefore command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard full of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. As our Lenten journey has become an arduous way of the cross, in company with Jesus, let us pray for the whole human family at this time of global crisis. So we pray firstly for the church and all Christian communities around the world, for all church leaders, ministers and lay people as they seek to reach out to all those in need during these difficult times. We pray especially for our own clergy and lay assistants as they seek to maintain your church family across all denominations here in Broadstone. May their loving care for all in need be a powerful sign of the saving death and resurrection of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray and give thanks for our overstretched frontline health workers and all essential services personnel working long hours in often difficult circumstances. May their dedication inspire us to new levels of generous service and neighbourly care. We pray for all in positions of authority and leadership in every nation as together they carry the burden of managing the response to the current crisis. We pray also for scientists advising governments and researchers worldwide who are seeking a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus. And loving God, we pray for all in our communities who are working tirelessly to help those who are often isolated and lonely. May they trust in you and care for one another as they respond to more and more calls for help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask you to protect our loved ones, friends and neighbours. We pray for those most vulnerable to the social, economic, 
and medical effects of this COVID-19 outbreak. The frail, the chronically ill, the poor, the homeless and especially all those whose mental health is jeopardised by isolation and confinement. May their faith in you and the support of family and friends help them to cope with this challenge. And we pray for one another. May we find new ways to pray, to be connected in faith and to celebrate the Paschal mystery during this coming Holy Week. Today we pray especially from our electoral roll for Julie, Jim, Lavinia, Jill, Irene, Frank, Jennifer, John and Joy, Jean and Phil, and Keith and Maureen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Heavenly Father, we pray for those saddened by the death of someone close to them. In the midst of ongoing sorrow, help us all to rejoice in the hope, encouragement and comfort that your promise of eternal life brings to all who believe in Jesus. And so we commend to your everlasting love and care those who have died and whom we remember now. In particular, this week we pray for Edward Smith and for Gloria Wright, whose year's mind falls at this time. Father, may they rest in peace and rise in glory. Our trust is in you, O Lord. You are our God. Look on us, your servants, with kindness. And as we look forward to Holy Week and Easter, enfold us with your constant love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so with Christians around the world and throughout the ages, we gather up our prayers in the words which Jesus gave us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So friends, that brings to an end our service for today. It strikes me as we come to an end that we are about to enter into a Holy Week like none other that the Church has ever witnessed before. But I trust that as this year we've been forced to step into the way of the cross with particular keenness. So during Holy Week and once the current crisis is over, we will understand the joy of Easter all the more fully with its promise of eternal fellowship. As we head into that Holy Week now, wherever we are, I pray that unexpected blessings will find you. And I hope that you're able to walk some of this week with us here at St John's in our weekly updates and on our website, there will be links to services, particularly on Good Friday, when ministers from churches together in Broadstone hope to put together a short service about the cross. And on Easter morning, when Helen 
will be presiding at a Eucharist from her vicarage. But until then, uh, friends, be well, be blessed, and as Helen said last week, stay in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.